things are at its worst. And trust me, uh, Courtney, if you're watching right now, Daddy knows exactly what you're going through. Your sisters know what you're going through. And um, the best thing that could happen is to catch COVID and then be raptured. That'd be the best thing that could happen. I uh, mentioned in Pastor Mike online the other day, turn to Second Chronicles chapter 32 while I'm talking. Um, I mentioned in Pastor Mike online yesterday, the Bible says that uh, Paul tells us not to be ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, Israel, till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And what that means, I think, is God has the name of the last Gentile that's going to be saved. He knows their name. He knows when they were born. He knows when they're going to be saved. And they're going to be the last Gentile saved. Now, wouldn't that be awesome to be that Gentile? Now, we can't be. We've already been saved. But to be that last Gentile, to be rejecting Jesus all your life, life full of sin, drugs, you know, chasing everything this world has to offer, friend of yours has the gospel, trying to give it to you for years, you don't want anything to do with it, you're still partying and ha having a ball, and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost hits you like a ton of bricks, like a great big wave of the sea hitting you, and it just demolishes your defenses against the gospel. And you break down and you call this friend of yours, say, I want to learn about this Jesus you came to told me about that one day. And he comes over and he starts telling you the gospel and you believe it. And you know you're a sinner. You know you're headed for hell. So he starts re reeling off Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ro Romans 10.9 and 10, for if we... Um, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Uh, for John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. 1 John 5, 7, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. For, that's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you believe that. And you cry. And you ask God to save you. And he saves you. Fills you with the Holy Ghost. And then you go to heaven. Just like that. Because you're the last Gentile that's going to be saved. Jesus appears in the air and comes to get us all. And we're all going, don't worry, we're not jealous of you. Amen. We're all in heaven. It's going to be like that one of these days. He's going to come and get us. Now, 2 Chronicles 32. Uh, you pray for me this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've never been, uh, had a sickness as long as this is drug out. And um, so you pray for me, pray for our church, pray for those that are still afflicted with this, and just pray that, I, I don't, I personally am not wanting, with all the talk that they've made about a vaccine, I don't want it. But I do believe that they now have some things they know works against it. Um, the remdesivir, which I think they gave me that when I was in the hospital. Uh, and then, of course, the Regeneron that they gave uh, Trump. Uh, I was told by Ron that uh, he had heard that they are making that available through the VA. Uh, veterans Administration, the Veterans Hospitals. That would be, I would enlist just to get that. Yeah, so yeah, giving it away free. Uh, and according to Trump, he felt better, boom. So uh, vaccine, no, they'll never talk me into that one, but um, at least with a reasonable treatment. Um, that would be pretty awesome. I wish they would have had it when all of us had it. But I guess it takes a while to work on that stuff. So anyway, it's there, at least there's hope that hopefully one of these days we can...
put this behind us if China doesn't do something stupid again. But anyway, it's a bad one, and uh, I'm praying for all of those who still have it, those who've been affected by it, and you continue to pray for me. Pray for our church. I set November 8th. I talked to Brother Sterling about it. And let me, let me just say, that's one of the things that he does here at this church. He is our chief elder. He's the one we look to for wisdom, uh, for guidance on what to do. And uh, he's offered up some pretty good ideas about how uh, we should take care of this building as far as any possible contaminants, and we're looking into that. Um, but anyway, so just can keep praying for him. But uh, I set November 8th as sort of a date for us to get back going again. I, my prayer is my body catches up to that. Right now it's not. And if you were to tell me, okay, after this service, we got one more, I'll be going, oh, come on. Because uh, I'm pretty wiped now as it is. So just we have a lot of things to be thankful for, but a lot of things to pray about as well. Second Chronicles chapter 32. Uh, let me give you a little background before I get into reading this section of verses. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. If you look back in, in chapter 31, I want you to notice that something happened. And I'm not going to read this entire chapter uh, for time's sake and uh, for my lungs sake but i want you to notice <clears throat> in verse 5 of the previous chapter as soon as the commandment came abroad the children of israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn wine and oil and honey and all the increase of the field and tithe of all things brought they in abundantly now what what kind of dishes can you make with sheep oxen corn wine oil and honey a lot you, you can make casseroles out of this world, potlucks, amen? And I want you to notice that it says in verse 6, concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep, tithe of holy things which were consecrated unto the Lord their God, laid them by in heaps. By just sheer free will, Knowing that Hezekiah was wanting to live for God, wanted the people to live for God. God moved in such a way in the people that they literally just said, Honey, grab our best sheep. We're going into town. We're going to leave them there for the priest to sacrifice. And we're going to give that as an offering unto the Lord. They brought in so much stuff. Corn, wine, oil, honey, sheep, oxen, you name it. They brought it in that they had it laid up in heaps. I'm talking, thinking of like the corn, the oil, um, oxen and sheep they brought in live. And those weren't killed until they were ready to be sacrificed. So they were probably kept somewhere alive. But the bottom line is... They brought in so much food in Jerusalem, they didn't know what to do with it. They just had it piled up. Hezekiah inquired about the heaps. Where did all this come from? People just started bringing it in. We just, we don't know what to do with it. They're bringing so much. So he ordered that they start building barns and buildings for them to store all that stuff in to be able to keep it. All of this, God did for a reason. God knew what he was doing. And the reason, now remember, there's revival going on. And I want you to think about something. I mentioned, Michael, do you remember? I mentioned to you probably a couple months ago. I said, Michael, let's feed those people again. Let's bless those orphans. And I told you, and I told the gals at work here, get ready. Devil's going to hit us because we're fixing to do this all over again for the Lord. Remember that? Yep. And he did. He hit us in a way I never thought possible. Never even, never even occurred to me. Um, I want us to be careful. I have the responsibility of weighing out, number one, 
This is a fellowshipping church. We love to shake hands, talk to one another, visit with one another. Well, that's how you transmit COVID. And I want you to think about that. Through the act of fellowship, talking to one another, as I'm talking, you can't see it, but I'm spitting droplets. This is why nobody sits on the front row. I'm spitting droplets of saliva out of my mouth every time I talk or just breathe. There's no way around it. And I'm shooting those things out into the air. And if I was still infected with COVID, I would be sending out spit filled with COVID virus. And when someone says, hi, what do we do? Hi. We breathe it in. And that's part of how it's transmitted. Okay. Um, we shake hands. Uh, the nurse told Lisa and I, after her surgery, even the people that wear gloves, you go into the store, you wear your gloves in Walmart, and you pick everything up, and you get your checkbook out, or your credit card out, or whatever, your money, and then you get in the car and you take the gloves off. But everything you touched in the store, you touched with your gloves. And then you're going to go home and touch those things again with your hands. And that also is how it gets transmitted. Shaking hands, hugging one another. So I have to weigh, as pastor, the responsibility of number one, not wanting this to go back through our church again. I don't, there are some flus that you can get them over and over again. And it's possible that COVID is one of those flus. I don't want it. I never want this ever again. And so we have some things to pray about in our church, how to get back to normal. And it may take a while. It may take a while. Uh, some of the folks aren't going to come back for a while. That much I know. And I understand that. Um, so far, I've not shaken anybody's hand here. I'm not, it's not that I'm being mean or anything like that. It's just I'm, I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little nervous just because COVID hasn't gone away yet. And I haven't even hugged my sister. And it's just because COVID hasn't gone away yet. And so there are some things for us as a church that I want us to be prayerful of, mindful of, respectful of, um, I want us to eventually get back to being that close, friendly church that we used to be. But the devil, if he knew where to hit us, he hit us in that exact spot. And um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's pray about that. I'm going to preach sort of along those lines. I'm not going to mention COVID an awful lot, but I'm going to mention I preached a Sunday. In fact, the last sermon I preached Back in September 20th, if you remember, was about walls. Here's why. And I want you to think about it. Every time there is a mighty work of God, the devil is almost assuredly going to follow that up with persecution. Almost without fail. Now, if you read the scriptures, study it, you know what tribulation and persecution, you know how that's good for us. It keeps us from getting a haughty spirit, a spirit that says, why look at us. God must love us so much. He's decided to do this great thing in our midst. We must be the very special people of God. And God don't want children that way. God wants children humbled. God wants children that he can bend over his knee every now and then and take a rod to our backside and whip the fire out of us every now and then. And that's why 
when God does a mighty work in our midst, God is sure to allow the devil to come behind that and persecute us the, for that. And notice the pattern here in the life of Hezekiah. He brings the revival. The people bring in the heaps that they are taken care of. But the fact remains, when you've got an angry army sitting outside the door, you don't have a party while that guy's out there. You don't act like everything's normal and everything's going to be okay. You do, it's not normal to act that way. It is normal to act in fear. It's normal. David never said, I will never be afraid. Being afraid's a sin. He never said that. He said, what time I am afraid. David got afraid too. Okay? So keep that in mind. Second Chronicles 32, verse 1. After these things in the establishment thereof, Sennacherib. He's got the word cherub in his name. He is more than likely named after one of his gods. That's just a guess of mine. I haven't looked it up. But we know that he worships a false god. So is he the friend of Jerusalem? Is he the friend of Hezekiah? Is he knocking on his door to sell him some Avon or perhaps a vacuum cleaner? No. No Amway, nothing like that. He's there to kill them. He's there to either kill them, take them as slaves... And then spoil the city. Now, if I remember right, at this time, inside the temple are the treasures of the temple. Nebuchadnezzar hasn't come and taken them out yet. Um, I can't remember if Josiah the king has already been. Um, but anyway, we still have treasures inside the temple of the Lord. And it's possible that he's coming after those treasures. But one way or the other, he wants the spoil of the cities of Judah and the spoil of Jerusalem itself. And so he entered into Judah and encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. Now, we're not going to get into the whole spiel that Sennacherib gave. He goes out there boasting, saying, I've conquered all these cities. And they cried to their gods. And were their gods able to stop me? No. And don't believe Hezekiah when he tells you that your God will be able to stop me. Because no God has been able to stop me. Well, God stopped him. But they didn't know that. They didn't know that. Ask yourself the question, how much of the future does God actually reveal to us? Not much. He's not told us the day or the hour. He's not told us anything like that. We have some of the signs in the seasons of the Lord's coming. But there are, there's a wide range of people. Some are saying he could come any moment. Some are saying, oh, I've got the date picked out. It's going to be next year. Some are saying, who knows? But we don't know the future, especially when the enemy comes and surrounds us. We don't know what's, we don't know what's going to happen. I'd like to die in my sleep, but I don't know that I'm going to get that. I'm not afraid of death itself. I'm afraid of it hurting. That's me. But he surrounded the city. Verse 2, when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city. And they did help him. So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And then verse 5, also he strengthened himself, built up the wall that was broken. Remember those walls I preached about. And raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. And he set captains of war over the people, gathered them together to be uh, uh, to him in the street of the gate of the city and spake comfortably to them, saying, be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria. How many times do you find in the Bible, be not afraid, be not afraid, be not afraid? Joshua, 
on the day the sun stood still, he gathered his captains. They had captured the five kings and the five lords of the Philistines. And he told his captains, come, be not afraid of them. Be not afraid nor dismayed by these people. Don't worry about them. Come put your necks, your feet on the necks of these kings. Thus shall the Lord God to do you all your enemies against whom you fight. But... Did God ever say that we wouldn't have those enemies to begin with? No. Do our enemies serve a purpose? They always serve a purpose. So he says, be strong and courageous. Be not afraid to dismayed for the king of Assyria. No, for all the multitude that is with him. Notice what he says. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us. And to fight our battles. Look at that. To underline that. What are we supposed to do? Fight our battles? It's not what he says. The Lord is there to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. You pray for me this morning. I am very weak. Father, I need your help today. I need your strength. I need your guidance. I thank you, Lord, for the word that we have. And Father, I, I, I have no doubt that I have plenty of verses to give to these people. But Father, your Holy Spirit must preach to them on the inside, what I preach on the outside. I have no ability with these people to change their heart, change their attitude, change their mind, to give them patience, to give them encouragement. Father, I, I thank you, Lord, for the way you blessed the prayer time that I had with Brother Sterling. And Father, I take no credit at all for his improvement that was you that was all you and I did very little except give him the word and father I get fearful you know I do I get very afraid I get very tired my body is weak and sometimes my mind and my heart is weak as well. So Father, if these people, any of these people, both here and those online, were counting on me to accomplish something for their life, it won't happen. I'll fail almost every time. So, Father, it's never about me, and it never was about me. It was always about your word. And your word is what revives us. Your word is what breathed life into Lazarus. It was your word that went forth, that created the universe. It, it is the word, the same word, that abides this day, that gives people life and gives people new life. And yet will give us new life again in heaven. So Father, for those that are afflicted. Or those that are in revival. The affliction's going to come. But you've prepared them. And you worked ahead of time. So that when the tribulation comes. That we face often in our lives. The devil uses it to try to pull us away, to try to make us afraid. But it doesn't work. It never works. With those that are your saints. So Father, give me the grace to say what you want me to say. May I only say what you want me to say. And may your words be the blessing that somebody really needs today. Because I imagine, Father, that if I'm in fear and I'm weak, then I know, Lord, that there's bound to be 
others and maybe a lot more than I could possibly imagine. And Father, there's probably people in this church that have been afflicted, invaded, reproached, tried, persecuted, troubled. The devil's made them afraid in some form or some way. And they found themselves running, running out of fear, living in fear. And Father, you didn't tell us that it was wrong to be afraid. If that's the case, I've been wrong way more times than I've ever been right. But Father, you took me from a time in my life when I was very prideful. And you weakened me just enough so that you could use me. And Father, I really wouldn't have it any other way. And Father, I don't want the way things are going now to be the new normal. I don't want that. But Father, I don't get to make that call. I don't make that choice. That choice is yours. And Lord, whether we ever get back to the way things used to be here at our church, or you decide in your wisdom that you have a much better way, then so be it. We'll follow that. God, we'll do it gladly. We'll follow it. I miss my people. I miss seeing them. And I pray, dear God, that you'd gather us all back together again. But, do Lord, do it your way, your timing. And we'll give you the praise for it. Father, bless this message. Help me to preach it. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Look up. Um, on the screen very quickly I mentioned I wrote down some things Jerusalem represents number one heavenly Jerusalem I want you to ask yourself the question will heavenly Jerusalem ever get invaded the answer is yes in Revelation chapter 12 we know that there is a war in heaven sorry John there is a war in heaven. What do you think that war is about? What does Isaiah 14 tell us that war is about? Isaiah 14, turn there. Some of you know it by heart. I know it by heart, but I want you to look at it just for the sake of the message this morning. Or excuse me, yeah, Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? We know who that is, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst what? Weaken the nations. What has he done with me? He's weakened me. In a way, I never, I never saw it coming. Ne we didn't know. Never saw it coming. I didn't know it would be as bad as it was. But it's weakened me in a way that I am finding it extremely difficult to get back on my feet. I am. I'm having a very hard time getting back to normal, getting back to when I came in here this morning, first thing I did was set my stuff down. I'd lay down on the couch for an hour. And the first week I came back, I did more sleeping here than I did anything else. I said, I might as well just stay home. That way I can sleep at home instead of coming here. I'm not ready yet to get back to that full schedule. He weakened me. And he didn't just do it physically. I can tell you that when I was at my sickest, my mind, your mind goes in places that you don't like going. I'm going to die is one of the things that I thought. And you have that fear. It is a lousy, terrible, awful sickness. And anybody that's had it, they, we all say the same thing. Melissa sent me a picture of her husband just covered in blankets upon blankets upon blankets, laying there freezing to death. And I'm going, really? What's that like? Boom! 
Oh, I know what it's like. Mom telling me that she sweated out the first big night that she had it. Really, Mom, what's that about? Boom, I got it. But he's weakened us, has he not? There are things that Paul said he wanted to do that he couldn't do. Ask yourself the question, the sins that you asked God to leave behind you many years ago, are they all gone yet? None of them are. He's weakened us. And if we were to stand up and say, bless God, I'll never do those things again. It'd be like me saying, I'll never catch COVID again. Boom. I'll probably get it before I get home. Who knows? But he's weakened us bad. Every one of us in one way or another. So I always, I am, just to say it this way, to anybody in our church that's listening, I am a lot different person than I was years ago. I'm a lot nicer to people, especially when they come to me and they say, Pastor, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, I have to admit something to you. I've been doing this or I've been, I have a problem with this or I have an issue with that. And I've never said to them, oh, well, I'm sorry, but you can't come to church here. I say to them, you know what? You're a godly person. Because according to Psalm 32, godly people repent. It's the godly people who say, I don't want this anymore. I don't want it in my life anymore. So I would rather have a church full of drunkards, dope addicts, people with various enslavements to sin than the self-righteous crowd. I'd rather have them any day. But if the devil is arrogant enough, because, I mean, I didn't finish reading that, but he says, Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yes. It is a picture of heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem above. The devil seeks to sit where only God sits. You believe that? Say amen. Number two, it represents the church or a church, including this one. We, I would say we've known this. We've had the devil attack us so many times just because of the, the way we believe, the way that we stand on certain things, the things that God has us doing. It is a part and parcel of what it means to serve God and to do it correctly and to do it with the right attitude and do it with the right spirit. That whenever you serve God, God will weaken or God will allow the Satan to weaken. He weakens churches. We would like to be able to say that we're the mighty church of God. We can never be brought down. And yet look at look around you. He's wiped us out. That has been made very clear. If you look in Revelation 13, I'm not going to turn there. If you look at Revelation 13, God allows the beast to overcome the saints. He makes war against them and overcomes them. Now, he's not just talking about St. Jude and St. Mary and St. Peter. and He's talking about all of us. Jerusalem also represents the heart of a believer. And the devil is constantly attacking your faith constantly attacking your faith to make you a lust after the things you're on the inside of the wall 
God built that wall. I preached that message for a reason. Didn't understand it back September 20th. I get it now. The COVID virus, here I am preaching about COVID virus. COVID virus is Sennacherib. It is outside, the wall is my skin. It wants in to destroy. That's all it wants. It wants to rob me of the resources that I have in my body to benefit itself. And it wants to destroy me. Left untreated, unchecked, there's a high probability that it would have done it. And think about that. The virus of false doctrine, the virus of the temptations of the flesh that are outside of the sheepfold of Jesus Christ. He never allows those things into the sheepfold. He says they're out there. And if you're going to do them, you're going to have to go out there to do them. Many sheep, or I will say it this way, many goats have left the fold including people who used to go to church here. Many of them drawn out by the desires of the flesh. Psalm, let me read some Psalms to you. Just very quickly, Psalm 17, 7. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. From the wicked that oppress me. From my deadly enemies who compass me about. He's, Sennacherib circled this city. All the way around. It didn't just show up at one gate. There was multiple gates in this city. So he circled with an army. A deadly army. An army that would have killed them or taken them slaves. Surrounded those cities, compassed us about to invade our heart, to invade, go after our faith, go after our morality, go after our families, our homes. When they told us to quarantine in our houses, our houses have walls, don't they? There's a reason for that. Um, but from my deadly enemies who compass me about. Notice that he said, save us by thy right hand. What's in the right hand? The book. Psalm 25, 17. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Multiple distresses. Look upon my affliction and my pain. Ah, oh, I have been there. Although I didn't have the pain that you had, sis. I didn't have that. Some did. Look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies for they are many and they hate me with cruel hatred. For some reason I find myself being a student of World War II and Hitler. And I am, I am amazed at how... Hitler was able to convince all of the people of Germany that all of the Jews were the enemies, their own citizens, their own fellow German citizens, that they were the enemies of the state and it would be best if we had them all slaughtered. He convinced almost everybody in Germany that that was the best way. So much so that his soldiers, his generals, his lieutenants never batted an eye when the orders came down to have them taken to the concentration camps, off the trains, the ones who survived, immediately into the gas room where they were killed and then their bodies thrown into the incinerators. How quickly he was able to convince them of that. Would that ever happen again? Yes. It will happen again. There is a cruel hatred rising in this world. Psalm 27, 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. 
He didn't say, Lord, make it so I never have enemies again. What are the enemies for? According to this verse, so that God can instruct us in his ways and show us the path that he wants to lead us on. Psalm 38, verse 18, I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin, but mine enemies are lively. They are strong. So notice this, the devil weakened us but our enemies remain strong. And they that hate me wrongfully are multiplied. They also that render evil for good are mine adversaries, because I follow the thing that good is. Why do they hate us? What do we want to offer this world? Mercy, forgiveness, a home in heaven with Jesus forever, riches and glory that will never fade away. That's all we want to offer people. And yet they hate us. Why do they hate us? Because we follow the thing that good is. Forsake me not, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. Now Psalm 71, I don't know why that's so small, but you might have to look that one up if you can't see it. Psalm 71:10. For mine enemies speak against me, and they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together. There is a conspiracy. Saying, God hath forsaken him, persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. I can remember at one point thinking, and this is how it worked against my mind, I can't, I, I can't stand to be sick like this for any longer I did I would wake up and after about an hour realizing that I was still sick saying to myself I can't take this I can't take being sick like this I'm not very strong Anything that good that has happened in me, through me, to me, because of me has been nothing but the grace of Almighty God. Um, I want to look back. There's something I want, I want to see here. What verse was it from? I guess Psalm 25 again, verse 19. Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Now, watch this. The, if you read all of that story about Sennacherib coming against them, he, he encompassed Jerusalem and they sealed off the city. Now, he's telling, he's telling everybody in the city, don't listen to Hezekiah. Don't listen to what he says because he's telling you that your God is going to save you. I fought many gods. I fought the gods of many cities. I conquered all those cities. Their gods did not help them. They're, and your God is not going to help you. Now, let me tell you, that is a common thought amongst believers. That the devil tells us, God is not going to help you. He's not going to save you. He's not going to deliver you. You might as well leave. And I want everybody listening to me. Don't leave. It's a trap. That's the purpose of it. What do you, I mean, think about Sennacherib. He's, he's acting all tough, right? If he was that tough, why didn't you just start tearing down those walls and, and attack that city? Why is he trying to talk everybody out? And I'm sure that there is... I had the memory of the people on 9-11 at the top of those towers who finally leapt out of those towers to their death having no alternative. That's a horrible way to die. Either way, burning up or leaping to your death from 110 tall 110 story tall building. That is the worst. I cannot fathom that. 
And the devil will convince you that it's that bad and that God will not save you. And what he's trying to do, he's trying to get you to leave. Don't do it. Let's look at what Hezekiah did. There's three things he did. Back in, um, in fact, well, I, gotta, I have to move on. Yeah, let's look at what Hezekiah did. Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 3. He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men, number one, to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. Number one, big lesson here. Don't try it alone. Don't, don't isolate. Don't try to just do it on your own. You can't. Even Hezekiah the king took counsel. He didn't have all the brains, all the smarts. He didn't know everything. He was a man like you and I are. God put it in his heart to take counsel what to do. If you, as a part of this church, find yourself in a situation that you don't think you're going to be, be able to get through it, find somebody. Call me. Come see me. Get with somebody that you trust. Tell them what's going on. But don't try to do it alone. He took counsel with his princes and his mighty men, stopped the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. So there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? Water represents a lot of things in the Bible. In fact, name for me a story in the Bible that does not have water in it. Almost all of them do. For some reason, there's water in almost every story in the Bible. There's water somehow, some way. A brook, a river, a sea, a pitcher of water, Noah's flood, that water, right? Psalm 36, 9, for with thee is a fountain of life. So, Proverbs 5, 18, let, the fountain, let thy fountain be blessed. He's talking about our offspring. And rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Proverbs 13, 14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Proverbs 14, 27, this is, what, this is where I was trying to remember this. For, Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Who should we fear? The Lord. The devil can't touch you. The fountain of life that God has given us is one of the seven spirits of God, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And the devil does what he does to you to try to get you to voluntarily leave. Leave out of fear. Leave out of fear. Leave out of fear that your sins are going to be discovered. You're going to be found out for who you are. Well, I just, I would just better leave then so that people don't find out. Well, God has a better way. It's called confession. Confession. And once they're confessed, they're covered. Covered over. Not even God's going to bring them back. Jeremiah 17, 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake, forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Because... What did Jesus do when they brought the woman caught in adultery to him? He started writing in the earth, didn't he? Remember that? Look at that verse. Let them, and, all, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of the living waters. Isn't that something? You might want to make a little note in your Bible, that verse. That's good stuff. And I didn't find that. Somebody sent that to me. And I went, yeah, that's pretty good. God, why didn't you give me that? Micah just did. Read your email. 
Revelation 21, 6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Now, your Bible is the fountain of life. So what's the devil trying to take away from you? Bible reading. Bible reading. I hit it twice this week. Pastor Mike online. You may not have liked everything I said. You may not have agreed with everything I said. Or you may not have agreed with anything I said. But the point of both of those videos was to draw you to spend time where the fountain of life is. Is the fountain of life in the internet It's in your Bible, people. Number two. Second Chronicles 32, 5. Also he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without. Hey, let's not just count on one wall. Let's put up another one. And made darts and shields in abundance. You know what? They never used them. What does having more nuclear missiles than the enemy nation do? Keeps the enemies from firing their missiles. You'll just fire them back. Amen? The... One with the biggest army, with the most capable weapons, will prevent a war being started because the enemy doesn't have those kind of enemies or those weapons didn't have that many soldiers. Makes sense. That's what Reagan believed and it worked. It broke the Berlin Wall down. Wall equals an impenetrable Separation. Do you think about that? It is how God separates us from this world. Zechariah 2 verse 4, he said unto him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I say that the Lord will be under her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. I guarantee if it's a wall of fire, ain't nobody going to run through it. God himself is the wall surrounding his saints. But what it does, it separates his saints from what's in this world. Do we not need that separation? Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine is not my word like as a fire. So what is that wall of fire round about? It's his word, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Ephesians six sixteen. I mean, we have all of this above all taking the shield of faith. That's a wall. Wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The helmet of salvation. The helmet's a wall. Protecting your head. This helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. God means to use. Whether it's a sheepfold. A city wall. A house. Or a shield. Any one of those things. God intends to use those. To separate us. From the harm that is in this world. Young people, consider that. Because there's you got in your mind, one of these days I'm going to move out of my mom and dad's house and I'll be able to do whatever I want to do. Go talk to my kids about that one. In fact, talk to me about it. We said the same thing. I'll get out of mom and dad's house. I won't have to do what they tell me. I'll do whatever I want to. That was a big mistake. Big mistake. Psalm 18, 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in him in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. See, he built towers too. What are towers good for? 
What's a, why do you put a deer stand up in a tree, JR? Why would you put one up there? A lot easier to shoot them. Deer don't, deer don't look normally up in trees for predators. They're looking down for acorns, right? Psalm 61, 3, For thou hast been a shelter to me, a strong tower from the enemy. Psalm 144, My goodness and my fortress, my high tower, my deliverer, my shield in whom I trust, uh, who subdueth my people under me. Proverbs 18, 10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. See, it's a separation. Psalm 91, my favorite psalm, one of my favorite psalms. He who abideth in the secret place, I can't remember it. I thought I could. I thought I had it in my notes. I probably do, I just ain't there yet. Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. Who are you going to run to when you're in trouble? Who did I run to when I was in trouble? Ran to the Lord. I had no other place to turn to. I had no other place to go. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. That's what a virus is, by the way. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling for he shall give his angels charge over thee pay attention to that because that's where I'm going and back in 2nd Chronicles 32 verse 6 he set captains of war over the people do you know who the people were the militia the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed because we need a well-regulated militia. We need people in a time of war, people, men who already have guns and know how to use them, have already bought 500 or so rounds of AR-15 ammo. Thank you, Brother Edge. Be set captains of war over the people and gather them together to him in the street of the gate of the city. You think he was going to just rely upon the soldiers? No. Hey, everybody, all you guys, get your stuff. We're fixing, to, we're fixing to go stand against this enemy. And spake comfortably to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people re rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. You remember that? Look at this. Don't you feel better when the police show up? Hey, there's, there's somebody getting beat up over there. And all of a sudden the police show up. I feel better now. See all those art, look at that. Those soldiers coming off on Omaha Beach. After wave one, wave two, wave three got nearly shot and destroyed. Finally, we got those Germans bunkered down. And all Adolf Hitler saw was just waves of tanks rolling onto the beach. And it was within a year that Hitler put a gun in his head and blew his brains out. He lost. Do you remember how the people of France greeted those American and British soldiers? They came out with bottles of champagne. Welcome! Welcome to France! That was their problem. They had way too much champagne, not enough ammo. Amen. God wants to encourage you. Turn to 2 Kings very quickly, and I'm going to be done. I've got to go home. 2 Kings chapter 6. 
Remember what Hezekiah told him? There's more with us than there is with them. 2 Kings 6, 15, When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? In other words, how are we going to get out of this? And he answered, Fear not. God, God would have to say that to me. You can't tell me. My, now, Mike, don't calm down. Don't be afraid. You can't tell me that. I have every right to be afraid. I'll be afraid if I want to. But if God says it, you know what? You won't be afraid. Our forefathers stood against the Roman Catholic Church and was tied to a stake in the midst of a city, a town, a village, and literally was set on fire while they were alive. Them, their wives, and their children. Them knowing that a match was to be lit and they were going to burn them alive. Greeted it gladly. You cannot tell me, Mike, go jump in the fire. You cannot tell me that and make me do that. God can. God can. Again, I'm not preaching to you out of strength today because I don't have it. How shall we do? Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord. And he said, smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Hezekiah was right. There is more with us than there is with them. And with them... All they have is an arm of flesh. That's all they have. We are, according to Psalm 91, we are, verse 11, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Who in here has a story of how angels saved your life one day? You live long enough, you'll have one. You'll know it. You'll know it that they did it. Um, let me go back to this, and I'm going to quit. Um, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, this is about the second or third sermon I ever preached in my life. I preached out of this passage because this just stuck out to me. The three armies, the Moabites, the Edomites, the um, uh, children of Mount Seir, the... Um, yeah... We're, yeah, the, the Ammonites, the, excuse me, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites from Mount Seir. That's Esau and his lineage. They came down while Jehoshaphat was king, and they were going to do the exact same thing that Sennacherib was doing. is going to destroy Jerusalem and take it over. And Jehoshaphat realized that he could not fight that battle. He knew, he, he knew that they did not have enough soldiers. They just could not win that war. You got three primary armies coming against them. That's lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. In verse 14, upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. There he says it again, be not afraid. For the battle is not yours, but God's. That's two different stories now we've seen where they were told, God's going to do this. God's going to fight this battle. You don't have to do anything. In fact, you can't. You can't win. Satan weakened you. You don't have it in you to win. The only winning that's going to happen is when God fights the battle for you. Amen? Let's go to prayer. Three things. Remember those three things Hezekiah did. Convinced them. Don't leave your Bible. Don't let, your, don't let the enemy take your Bible away from you. Number two, you need wall. You need to be separated. Your problem is you got too much of the world around you. Number three, we really are on the winning team. 
Don't let the devil convince you otherwise. And I listen, as hard as this has been, I have to tell you, God's going to give us rest. And then the next thing's going to be worse. That's what I had to tell you. Don't leave. Don't leave. Father, I ask your blessings on your word today for those that are here, those that are online. And Father, I can't say it any better than what I've said it. I can't make people believe anything that I've said. I can't make them believe your word either. Only you can do that. And Father, there's bound to be people right now listening to me right now struggling. Bound to be. Struggling with disease. Struggling, Father, with sin. Struggling with, Lord, the, just the, the vexation of this world. It gets to us, God. We don't want to go through it. God, we're faced with an election coming up, God, where there is at least the talk of civil strife, seditions, cities on fire, possibly a civil war. Now, Father, we don't want to go through this. We're supposed to pray for our country and our leaders that we live a quiet and peaceable life. And this is not very peaceable right now. But Father... Get us through one thing at a time. Get us through this day. We wake up tomorrow. Get us through the next day. And you be our God. You be our shield. You be our protector. You hide us under your wings. So that whatever the devil throws at us. Father will not separate us. From the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Help us, dear God, to never be so full of fear that we run. Don't let us leave. Don't let the devil take away our Bibles. And help us to stand. We love you and we ask your blessings today on this word and upon these people. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Appreciate you being with us today. You are dismissed.